Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss the rotational states of hydrogen H2. We will see that certain experimental facts are derivable from the theory of quantum mechanics. For this video, we are considering a hydrogen molecule where each of the two hydrogen atoms are the isotope hydrogen 1, sometimes called protium. The nucleus of this isotope consists of a single proton. The proton is a spin one half particle, just like the electron is. So therefore, an ensemble of protons must have an anti-symmetric wave function. This means if we interchange two uh, fermions, such as the first nucleus and the second nucleus, the wave function must change sign. Just like electrons, protons are spin one half particles, and therefore the wave function for an ensemble of protons has to be anti-symmetric. In other words, protons are fermions and they obey Fermi-Dirac statistics. Now, when we refer to the total spin angular momentum of electrons, we use the quantum number S. By analogy, for the spin of nuclear particles, we use the quantum number I. So therefore, we can think of the proton as an I equals one half spin particle. So here we look at the projection of the nuclear spin along the intermolecular axis. And here we have a spin of one half being an up spin. And here we have a spin of minus one half for a down spin. So in this particular case, you have spin plus a half spin minus a half, the sum total for the quantum number i is going to be equal to zero. And we can define a nuclear part of the wave function, which will have psi sub n. And we recall that it has to be anti-symmetric. So for this anti-symmetric singlet state, we can define spin functions exactly the same way that we would for electrons. So here, alpha means that we have a spin up particle, i equals one half. And here we have uh, spin down equals minus one half. We have to have this particular linear combination because if we switch one and two, the wave function here has to change sign. This particular case for spin up and spin down, we call para hydrogen. And that's one of four possible cases of spin combinations for H2. We have shown in green the three remaining spin possibilities, two of which are straightforward and one of which seems kind of complicated. So one of the possibilities is have both spins up. So this gives us alpha 1, alpha 2. We can have both spins being down, which is our beta 1, beta 2. And the one that seems kind of complicated here is we have another example where you have spin up and spin down. And we have a uh, linear combination that looks very similar to the singlet state. But here we notice that in this having the plus sign, that now we have a symmetric part. So we've seen that the wave function in red is anti-symmetric for the nuclear spins. The ones in green are all symmetric. And these three form the triplet. The overall value of i is equal to 1. What I did not mention before was up here the m sub i value is equal to 0. And here we have m sub i equal to plus 1, minus 1, and 0. Exactly by analogy to the case for a singlet and triplet uh, combination of two electrons. The linear combinations work out exactly the same way. If we have the red singlet anti-symmetric combination, we have para-hydrogen. And if we have the green case, 
where we have the triplet that is a symmetric nuclear spin part, then we have so-called orthohydrogen. So let's examine more closely the case of parahydrogen, where we have an anti-symmetric nuclear spin wave function. We know that the overall wave function has to be anti-symmetric. But this wave function here, while it accounts for the nuclear spin, does not account for the rotation of the molecule. For the sake of completeness, let me show you all the factors that would be needed to consider for the nuclear spin states of H2 molecule. So one, as we've been looking at so far, is the wave function for the nuclear spins. There is a wave function that has to do with the rotational states of that combination of two nuclei. We have a vibrational contribution and we have a translational contribution. Now, it turns out the translational thing does not affect the uh, symmetry here. So this we can drop out. As it translates, the symmetry or anti-symmetry of the wave function doesn't change. The vibrational one, so long as we stay in the ground vibrational state, so we're assuming that we're at sufficiently low temperature, that we're in the ground vibrational state for the H2 molecule, the lowest vibrational state uh, is a symmetric wave function. So that's equivalent to multiplying by one, so we do not need to consider it any further. But the remaining two are important. So we've noticed that the spin part is anti-symmetric. And let me just put this down as A for anti-symmetric. We know that the overall wave function has to be anti-symmetric because it involves fermions and fermions obey Fermi-Dirac statistics and they are required to have anti-symmetric wave functions. So this has to be anti-symmetric. So this imposes a condition on the rotational states that are available for this molecule. Whatever the wave function is must be symmetric. So by the principle of anti-symmetry, we realize that the rotational wave function must be symmetric when we're dealing with para-hydrogen. It turns out, by a rationale which we will mention in just a minute, that the rotational wave function is symmetric whenever j is an even number. So if the j values are 0 to 4, where j is the rotational quantum number, then we have a symmetric wave function for the rotational part, which allows the overall wave function to be anti-symmetric as required. On the other hand, if j is an odd value, so j is equal to 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on, then it involves an anti-symmetric rotational part. So by this reasoning, we see that when we have para-hydrogen, it is forbidden to have odd rotational states. It is limited to the even rotational states, which also means that if it changes rotational state, it has to change by two units because it has to go from one even number to another even number, which is not true for the typical rotating molecule. So let us now look at exactly how we could figure out that the even rotational states are symmetric. The rotational wave functions are exactly the same wave functions that are used for orbital angular momentum in three dimensions. So the J wave functions are exactly the same as the ones that we typically use for L. Now their form, particularly when they're in spherical coordinates, makes it very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to easily determine whether they are symmetric or anti-symmetric. So we are going to use an analogy that is absolutely accurate that will make it easier for us to determine this. So by analogy with, between J and L, we realize that if we have L is equal to zero, then we have an S orbital. If L is equal to two, 
we have a d orbital. So now we can visually inspect the anti-symmetry properties of s or d orbitals, and that will allow us to generalize the anti-symmetry properties of any even j state. Here I have a quick and dirty sketch of an s orbital. And we recall that s orbitals are garata. They are completely symmetric. So if I go from one point on this side, I have a positive value, and go through the origin to the other side, I am also at a positive value. So the wave function keeps its sign when we invert through the center. Similarly, for d orbitals, if I have this particular phase here, so let's say the darkened phase is the negative phase, here's a negative value of the wave function. When I go through zero to the other side, I am again at a negative value. The wave function has not changed side. And the same happens if I go here, I have a positive phase, go through the origin, and again, I have a positive phase. So it is symmetric with respect to inversion through the center, which is equivalent to being uh, symmetric with respect to permutation of the two nuclei, because they will be on opposite sides of the rotational center. So therefore, I see at least for two of the L values that when there are even numbers, that they are symmetric. So let us see what the case would be if we had an odd value of j, which would correspond to an odd value of l. If l is equal to 1, this corresponds to the very important p orbital. And we're going to use this as a representation uh, that's easier to see of exactly the same wave function that we would have for j equals 1. And by extension, for any particular negative um, odd value, of j. And we recall that the p orbital has two phases, and that if we go from this side, which is the negative phase, through the center to the opposite side, we change sign. It is anti-symmetric with respect to inversion. It is un garata. And I'm not going to draw because it's quite a pain, but you can look at any chemistry textbook for reference to see a, a graphic representation of f orbitals to see that they are indeed also anti-symmetric with respect to inversion. And this pattern is completely generalizable for any possible values of L and exactly by analogy for any possible values of J. We see the alteration between the uh, even values of J or L, which are all symmetric, and the odd values of L, which are all anti-symmetric. And that is exactly the reasoning that we use to determine that the uh, since this has to be symmetric, that j is restricted to even values of j. Now we turn our attention to the ortho hydrogen, and we've just listed one of the possible wave functions here. Though we know that there are three, we have a triplet state, and in the absence of a magnetic field, all three possible spin states have exactly the same energy. It is triply degenerate. So we remind ourselves that the nuclear spin part of the wave function and for the triplet ortho hydrogen is symmetric. As we saw before, you still have the case that the wave function for the nuclei is equal to the wave function for the spin part, which we now see is symmetric in this case, times the rotational part, times the vibrational part, times the tri translational part. We've already seen that we do not need to consider the translational. And if we assume that we stay in the ground vibrational state, then we can likewise omit reference to the vibrational part of the wave function. We know that the overall wave function for fermions has to be anti-symmetric. So the only way that this is possible is if the rotational part of the wave function is anti-symmetric. To get an anti-symmetric wave function for the rotational part, this requires that we have odd values of j. So 1 equals 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. It has to be an odd value because these rotational wave functions are anti-symmetric, which yields an overall anti-symmetric wave function for the H2 molecule. So an interesting feature is that 
there is no easy way to interconvert between ortho and para hydrogen because para hydrogen has a spin of zero and ortho has a spin of one. So therefore changes would be spin forbidden in the absence of something exotic like uh, spin orbit coupling. So therefore, if we have a combination of H2 molecules, it acts almost as if it is two different compounds, a certain ensemble of ortho hydrogens and the other of para hydrogens. And we have an interesting case for the rotational states that the change, because of the fact that the uh, ortho hydrogen is restricted to odd values of J and the para hydrogen is restricted to uh, even values of J, that the change in J is going to be plus or minus two, when typically we would see that the change in J for a rotational spectrum would be plus or minus one. I thank you very much for your attention, and as always, have a good one.